Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think we're ready to get started. Uh, my name is Michelle Dunn. I'm a uh, member of the board of the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, and I'm the director of the Rafiq Hariri Center for the Middle East at the Atlantic Council. And uh, I'm very pleased and proud to welcome you to the 2013 uh, NED Democracy Award, and this is our panel discussion on our democratic future, the role of youth in advancing democracy. We have with us uh, our uh, award recipients for this discussion. Um, starting at the end of the table, we have Rosa Maria Paya, who is accepting an award uh, on behalf of Harold Sapero. Uh, Rosa Maria is a youth leader of the Christian Liberation Movement and the daughter of its coordinator, Osvaldo Paya. Rosa Maria studied physics uh, at university, and she uh, attempted to study public administration and political theory uh, in Chile, but was denied the opportunity by the Cuban government. Since the car accident, which killed both her father and the award recipient, Harold Sapero, Rosa Maria has traveled the world seeking an investigation into the crash. She's spoken before the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, the European People's Party, uh, and numerous members of the United States Congress and the National Endowment for Democracy. Rosa Maria has carried on her father's mission of raising awareness about human rights violations in Cuba and using the Varela Project as a way of forcing the regime to confront its mistakes. While she has not uh, assumed formal leadership of the Christian liberation movement, she has become one of its most prominent public faces and one of the most influential voices in Cuba's struggle for human rights. Welcome, Rosa Maria. Thank you. Uh, our uh, next award recipient to my right is Glanis Changa Chirere. She's the founding director of the Institute for Young Women's Development, the IWYP, I'm sorry, the IWYD, established in Zimbabwe in 2009. This organization, which is a grantee of the NED, aims to promote sustainable livelihood among young women through education and empowerment. The institute also promotes women's rights and encourages female participation in decision-making and policy dialogue. Glanis became involved in her crusade for human rights as a result of her strong desire to receive an education. She defied societal norms and enrolled in university, where she joined the Student Representatives Council as the only woman. Despite frequent threats and attempts at, a, at intimidation, she continued to fight for women by vocally advocating for the right to education. In 2009, to further her mission, Glanis started the Institute for Young Women's Development to reach young girls in rural farming or mining towns who often lived in poverty and would likely never receive an education. The Institute has empowered thousands of young women who now have an important ally in their quest for education and rights in Zimbabwe. Welcome, Glanis. To my left is Vera Kachanova, a journalism student. And she was one of 71 members of the Our City Coalition of Independent and Opposition Activists to win seats on Moscow's uh, district legislative councils in 2012. Inspired by the December 2011 large anti-Putin protests, but not, con not content with street theater, Hundreds of young Moscovites, including Vera, had decided to run in the municipal elections. She parlayed her celebrity in the protest movement, getting readers of her popular blog to tell their friends in her district to vote for her. Her belief that real politics isn't just fighting in the streets, it's helping people in their daily lives, has resonated with opposition leaders who have embraced this grassroots strategy. Now, instead of creating anti-Kremlin placards and fretting about arrest, Vera plans to fight corruption from the inside and try to unwind the bureaucratic tangle that is a common complaint in Russia. She also is brainstorming plans for an online community forum, apartment co-ops, and a hotline for questions about army conscription. 
She has also vowed to remain an active participant in the protests. Welcome, Vera. Thank you. And our uh, fourth award recipient, Gulalai Ismail, founded Aware Girls when she was only 16 years old in Peshawar, the town near the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, where for two decades, violence has become the dominant norm of almost every aspect of life. The group has, has expanded beyond Peshawar and last year began providing services to women and girls in southwestern Baluchistan province. Through her organization, Gulalai has served to raise awareness in Peshawar of the equal status of men and women. Her organization teaches women leadership skills and how to negotiate within their families to get education and control over their own lives. For the May 2013 elections, her organization created the first citizen election observer team consisting of young women. Sexual harassment, however, makes organizing training for young women particularly difficult. And as a result, Ismail uh, and her organization must build bonds of trust with the families whose daughters uh, participate. She's also founded the Seeds of Peace Network in 2010, which promotes tolerance toward young people and challenges extremism. Welcome, Gulalai. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start our discussion with a few, a couple of general questions. I'm going to give each of our participants uh, an opportunity to answer them. And then we'll go on to some questions that are more specific about their situation. So uh, the question I'd like to throw out to begin with is that we hear a lot, uh, especially in countries like the United States, about young people being politically indifferent or cynical. Um, more obsessed with their Facebook friends or the latest trends in music or fashion. So what I want to know uh, from each of you is what motivated you to get involved in your particular struggles, uh, especially because you all come from countries where politics can be a dangerous activity. Uh, and I, I'm going to throw this question out. Rosa Maria, would you be able to start on that one? Well, I kind of I was born in this uh, environment. My family was a family who lived openly against the government. So for me, it was like the natural things to do <laughs> is, uh, is to work, or at least to be solidarious with the people which are in, in worse situations and try to change the situation to, to everybody could be happy in the way that they want. Uh, I, I have to say that for, for us, for my brothers, for, for the people in, in my family, and I could speak also for, for the childs of the partners of my father and mother. We have an opportunity that is unique in in our country, we could we could live uh, in a free way in inter society, which is not, and that's something that I I have to say thank you for. So you're saying that you mean you could live in a free way within your family because of the nature of your family? I mean, in in my country, and I dare to say in our countries, we we deal. Every day with situations when that compromise your liberties in the school right. and in the blocks where you live. And the special condition that we have was that we could speak freely because my mother and my father uh, were living in a free way. So they never uh, told to us, please remain silent, please don't do that. And, and that's something that my partners in the school uh, never had. So uh, that could be uh, one of the reasons that motivates me to start or to continue with, with this fight for the human rights. 
It's okay. Yeah. Not no. So absolutely. Yeah. Thank but you. But it's not like uh, her, it's not heroic. It's just what what we live in our family. Thank you, Glennis. What about you? What motivated you to become uh, active? Um, thank you. I think for me, I would say, um, as young people, our realities, our lived realities, inform our actions. They inform our thoughts. They inform our decisions. And for me, um, I'm somebody who grew up in um, a very humble community. I grew up in rural communities, and growing up in such a community where um, people believe that being a girl child is more than just being a nobody, I grew up um, going through a lot of injustices, a lot of things that I questioned when I was growing up, starting with um, my own education, where my, fa my parents really felt that it was not important for me to go to school, and so they wanted to um, support my brothers. And I felt that I was in a position really to do better for myself and, and change that particular situation. And it even became worse when I wanted to go to university and they told me that you're well educated enough, you can read and write, and all you need to do right now is just to get a man for yourself. And I thought that that wasn't fair because I realized there's more I could do to change my life and even my family's life. And so it's some of those things really that just um, gave me the edge to, to want to do more. And when I went to university, I realized that it's not something that was only inherent in my family, but it's something that we're living with uh, as a society, where male counterparts, like uh, the male students would see you as, as a nobody. Um, they would judge you and tell you that you're not capacitated enough to be here, and even the lecturers don't have confidence with you. So I just thought that I think there was need for me to do something to change the situation. And what even made it worse was when I went to university, this was a time when our country, Zimbabwe, was going through a lot in terms of uh, democratic transitions. And so I made a decision to get into the Students Representative Council to fight for female students, but I didn't know that I was taking a very political stance because then being in the Students Representative Council was, was viewed to be uh, political. And there were a lot of arrests that um, happened to me, a lot of intimidation, a lot of threats, and it's those things really that just gave me the strength to say I need to change my situation and I have to do something about this. And that's how I became to be an activist. If I could just follow up, so why did those things, the, the harassment and the intimidation and so forth you faced spur you to do more rather than, I mean, what, what that was intended to do was to make you stop? Yeah, yeah, so I actually felt that this is a multi-layer of oppression and what that was meant to do really was to stop me, but I wasn't prepared to stop because I wanted to change the environment around me. And I felt that it was worth it taking the risk, tackle the bull by the horns, but make sure that I change my situation for a better situation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vera, so Glanis just said our, our lived realities inform our actions. So what about you? How has your lived reality informed your actions and your activism? Actually, <clears throat> actually, I think that uh, I have always uh, been uh, interested in some activism. Uh, first, it was not political activism. I mean that I participated in some uh, school council and then students council. Uh, I've always been interested in uh, the opportunity. I've always been encouraged by the opportunity to change, uh, to influence on something more than uh, my own life. And uh, yes, you was true when you said that most of the young people they do not are not interested in politics. I would add that they are they are not because they do not see the connection between. Uh, what they call politics, I mean what is uh, happening uh, in uh, the parliament, what, what is discussed in the parliament, uh, who is the president, uh, who, which party is ruling and uh, which uh, political system do we have and, uh, and they don't, do not see the connection between the, all of this and their own life. And uh, actually if you start doing anything really in, in Russia, I, don't, I think that it's not only for Russia. Uh, really anything from ecological activism to students' uh, activism uh, to uh, some local activities in your own district, uh, then you face that there is politics in it. Uh, the, uh, that uh, there are... that. 
big politics really influence what's uh, going on in your own uh, district, in your own uh, school, in your own university, uh, even in, in the university, yes, even I had uh, such, a, such an experience when uh, president, uh, our ex-president Dmitry Medvedev came to uh, the university where I was studying. Uh, I've already finished it and, uh, well, uh, he was pretending to meet the students of uh, the university and actually uh, they were not students, there were uh, some uh, pro-Kremlin activists uh, playing the roles of the students and that was uh, the time. Uh, and then uh, me and some of my friends uh, protested and were arrested. Uh, and it was, uh, we were not, well, we were not doing, poli the politics uh, came to the place where we were. I mean that it really comes to any place uh, where you work if you just look around. And uh, yes, it may be really it may be really dangerous, uh, but I am. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I mean, uh, political activism. Uh, it uh, gives you the opportunity to meet uh, very interesting and very brave people, and I think that it's a good thing uh, that uh, for the balance. Uh, I mean that that you gave instead uh, that you receive instead. Uh, so I was. If speaking uh, how I was involved in this, I was reading uh, newspapers, I was uh, following the news, uh, reading about protests in Russia. It was between uh, about five years ago, and after I read about uh, another, uh, re another demonstration that was uh, uh, toughly dismissed, I felt that uh, I will be participating in the next, and I went out and I was arrested uh, as many other people, and I met uh, other democracy fighters in Russia, and that was how I got involved. Um, that's interesting what you say about um, how, you know, at, at a certain point, uh, young people young people don't always see the connection between politics, political action, and their own lives. In the area of the world that I work on, in the Middle East, I think that's something that really started to happen when we saw these uprisings in North Africa and elsewhere uh, that, that uh, people started, people and particularly young people started to see the connection between the very, you know, bad governing systems they had in their own lives and their own, their own opportunities, whether they were opportunities for organizing or even for getting a job and so forth, let alone political participation. Um, thank you. Uh, Gulalai, what about you? Did you, did you, was there something that made you see a connection between your own life and activism, whether it's political or social activism? Um, thank you. I was born in a culture, and I was born in a village uh, where there was a kind of culture where education for girls is, was not considered as right of girl, but as a privilege, where decision-making, women participation in decision-making was not a norm, but was a shame, where women were treated as objects. So, but at the same time, in my own country, I had seen women, wonderful women who, were, uh, who had control over their own lives, who were in politics. So I knew that a world is possible where women can have education, they can have employment, and they can be part of the governance and politics, because I have seen women in Pakistan who were who are very amazing. So it was inspiration from those wonderful women leaders uh, that I got, I got from them, and I decided that I will, I have to work for my own community, so that women in my community, in my village, they can also, they can also go further. They can also get education. They can also be part of the politics. They can also live their lives as citizens. So, a lot of uh, my inspiration has come from the women activists who have been working on women rights from decades. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the, the second general question is that um, the theme of this year's Democracy Award is, is the role of youth in advancing democracy. So what I want to ask you is what, what you think young people contribute to the struggle for democracy that uh, others of us, young, older adults, for example, don't appreciate as much as they should. Now we are living in a world where young people make the largest chunk of the population. 
and um, they are there for young people are shaping the futures of their country. They, we used to say that young people are future of their countries, but now today young people are present of their country because they make the largest population. So everything which happens in any country, it is about young people. We can see around the world that how young people are speaking up against dictatorship, they're raising their voices. So if young people are not happy with the kind of governance in any country, I think the governance that kind of government cannot sustain, and it, it has been proven. And then it's also because young people are important constituency of the country. So whenever policies are made, whenever decisions are made, it is important that young people are taken as partners in those decision makings. And when young people are systematically excluded from the decision making processes or from the political processes, it not only hinders the development process, process of the country, but it also creates frustration among young people. Okay, so young people contribute their, their numbers, their demographic weight, their critical mass, so to speak, uh, and then also, of course, you know, they, they can, be, uh, can become a real problem if they're excluded because of this. What, what do you think, Vera? What would you add to that? What do young people contribute to the struggle for democracy that maybe people in the older generations don't appreciate? I think that young people uh, have a very, are very global-minded. Uh, you, For example, you mentioned uh, fa- that uh, most of them are spending time online in Facebook, but Facebook and other social media are connecting them uh, from all of them, young people from all over the world. And uh, so uh, they are traveling a lot and they uh, want to live in their own country, like in the country they have seen, like in the modern countries they have seen. And uh, so, uh, particularly in Russia, uh, I've already told that uh, people usually do not see the connection between the democracy and the the level of... uh, the level of life, the quality of their life, and uh, but uh, now they start. They uh, they have already figured out that there is a, the connection. It is very, it's a very tight connection, uh, and that there will no be there will be no modernization without uh, human rights, without free elections, uh, because uh, the, in Russia we had uh, very mass protests last year and the year before, and uh, those people, those hundred thousands of people who were uh, going out on the streets, uh, they were not uh, protesting for some economic reasons. They were not uh, protesting uh, because they were unhappy about the the quality of their their life in economic uh, means, Uh, but they were uh, protesting against the fraud on elections they wanted because they they finally figured out that uh, if we have a free election, if we have, uh, if we have the, some uh, competi- competitive uh, political system, if we can uh, change the ones uh, who are ruling the country, then uh, we will uh, really live better. And I think that the youth uh, are the first to understand this thing. Okay, so young people are also adding sort of a level of global awareness um, and and maybe a, a keener sense of the connection between politics and, and how their lives will play out. What do you think, Lannis? What do you think young people are bringing to this struggle? Um, I think what, one thing that we need to appreciate is the fact that um, the leadership that we have currently in the different structures, um, they also started doing what they are doing now as young people and they need to acknowledge that leadership and democracy is a process. So as they are there and there's a younger generation that is coming, they also need to be where those people are today. And for me, I think what young people are bringing now is the transition that's necessary to sustain democracy. This is the processes that are building onto what has already been done by the people who are in some levels now. And also in terms of being able to transcend issues beyond certain periods, but uh, speaking to issues that resonate well with the generation of that age. Yeah. Okay, so um, young people are bringing a kind of um, awareness. When you say that uh, uh, 
awareness of issues that will resonate with people of their own age so that processes can be sustained as they uh, mature and come into leadership positions and so forth. Okay, thank you. Rosa Maria, what would you like to add? Well, I, I actually don't think that fighting for democracy is a matter of how old are you. I, at least not in my country, the, the lack of democracy is a problem who affects everybody. My grandma is affected also. But I, what I have experienced uh, in Cuba is that the young people is more committed right now. I, I have the feeling that we have, we, are, we have less fear of the change. And that's something that uh, the, the other generations could use to work together for this democracy. And I actually hope in that that's what is going on into the opposition in Cuba. People with uh, more experience and very young people, uh, we should get united because we have the same goal. We, we are fighting for the same specific demands. And that's actually what we are trying to do with our proposal with, uh, that we, we talk later. But uh, we don't have to work everybody in the same scene. But in our situation, we have to work everybody for the same objective. And, and that's more or less our scenario right now. You know, what you said about young people having less of a fear of change, uh, that also connects to what I've seen happening in the, uh, in the Middle East, in the countries that are undergoing transitions, and, and just less fear in general, less fear <laughs> of, you know, of, of confronting authority and less fear of whatever it is they might lose by, by having that confrontation. Um, Okay, then let's let's move on. I want to I want to pursue some more specific questions um, and regarding your individual experiences. So, uh, Gulalai, we'll we'll start with with you if that's uh, if that's okay. So, you know, the world was really alerted to the threats that young uh, women Pakistani activists face through the case of Malala Yousafzai, the 15 year old teenager shot in the head by a Taliban assassination attempt. And she was, I understand, in fact, involved with your group, uh, with the Wear Girls. Can you describe to us, you know, what it means? What's it, what is it like on a day-to-day -day basis to be pressing for rights and leadership development for girls in, uh, and young women in areas like the Swat Valley and the federal tribal areas? Uh, the incident of Malala, as you mentioned, um, it has alerted the world about the issues which are faced by women, especially young women, human rights defenders, and young women who are speaking up for themselves. But I would like to highlight that it also raises, it also highlighted that young women in Pakistan, even those who are living in very difficult areas such as Sabat and in other north, in other parts of the northwest of Pakistan, they are speaking up for themselves. They are raising voices. They are risking their own lives. But for them, when it comes to women rights and human rights, human rights are more important for them than their lives. So they are risking their lives and they are speaking up for it. I acknowledge that it is, it is very difficult. But we, as a human rights activists in Pakistan, especially in the northwest of Pakistan, we have learned how to, how to deal with the situation, how to create spaces for us, how to identify our allies, and how to work through the difficult situations. We have uh, women in Pakistan, and generally, they have used all the little spaces which they could, which they could get for themselves, and to use that as a platform for raising their voices. There are young women like Malala who are speaking up for themselves. There are other young women who are taking active part in the political process of the country, like for example, in our own organization with the, with the current elections when 
we decided to, uh, when we decided to monitor the elections, and we wanted to do the monitoring with a young woman, with, with young women team, which seems very difficult in the northwest of Pakistan to have an all young women team who will uh, sit in the polling stations, in the, uh, in the polling booths all day, like for 12 hours, because of the cultural difficulties. But because, but young women were so much motivated uh, they, they wanted to take part and they, they wanted to stood by, they wanted to stand by the right of vote of women. Many young women who, who are part of our team, they were asked by their parents that they should not be part of the team because it's life risking, but their answer was very clear cut. This is the time we have to stand up for women. This is the time we have to stand up for our right to vote. And if today we are not standing up for our right, it will become much more difficult. So. Around 100 women joined our team, and they, they did election monitoring, which was like a 7 a.m. to 12 in, in, the, in the night job. So, and in the northwest of Pakistan, in the rural villages, they did it. So young women in Pakistan, though they recognize the challenges, especially life risks they have, but they also want to change the world for themselves because this is our time. We know that we have to raise our voices because there are so many people, there are extremists who want to shut us, who want us to silence. And we know that we, uh, progressive people and people who are working for the development, we have already in Pakistan, we have already lost a lot of space. Our spaces have already been covered by the extremists. So we cannot take the opportunity to become silent. We have to speak up even if it takes our lives because it's not just about us as person. It is about our country. It is about the world. It is about peace. So, um, Galala, you're speaking of a very, a very immediate challenge, uh, a great deal of danger, uh, critical danger, and very dramatic and real situations, real risks. But I also want to ask you about more the everyday side of it, the almost banal side of it, and how do you, how do you challenge sort of the everyday prejudices and assumptions and so forth that that could hinder your efforts regarding women's rights and women's political involvement? Uh, one of the strategies we're using uh, by, for challenging the prejudice is by investing in girls' leadership and by investing in young women leadership. We, have, we are working with young women in the rural areas as well as in the urban areas to strengthen their leadership skills, to give them education about human rights, and to, and to educate them about how to negotiate within their own families for their own rights, how to negotiate and how to advocate within their own communities in these difficult situations for their own rights, because they have to speak up for their rights. So one of the strategy is strengthening leadership skills of young women, educating them about their rights, Another key strategy for us is engaging key stakeholders. For example, men are also important stakeholders when it comes to women empowerment work. So we have been doing programs to engage men to change their attitudes to, to create soft corners for, for young women who are doing wonderful work in their community. So we have also engaged young women and boys in our work to, to create spaces for women. Uh, for women. And third, our third strategy is to is to do policy level work. We know that it is important to bring changes in the attitude of people, but it's also important to have systems of protection for women who are speaking up for themselves. So we have also been advocating with policymakers to have systems, structures, and policies which can protect human rights of women. Are you speaking of changes on the level of law? And yes, so I'm forth? speaking yeah. on legal uh, changes. For example, we have uh, in the audience, we, we have one of my mentor, Dr. Fozia Said, with whom we have been uh, working for, uh, uh, for laws which can protect um, which can protect women from sexual harassment in the workplaces. So that was one of the strategy to create, uh, one of the strategy to protect women and to enable that women work, uh, that women get employment and they work in safe environment was to have laws which can protect women from sexual harassment in the workplaces. Similarly, we have also been advocating for laws uh, against domestic violence and uh, other kinds of gender-based violence. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Vera, let's, let's turn to the the this the case of of Russia and how you see the situation so the the ongoing trial of Alexei Navalny the prominent blogger and uh, opposition leader is just the latest in a series of moves uh, including the the foreign agent NGO law and so forth that seem to be designed to stifle dissent and intimidate uh Putin's critics. So what do you think is the significance of these measures, and what support do they have among 
Russian citizens in general. How do you think most people in Russia see these kinds of moves by the government to stifle dissent? I'm sure that uh, you mentioned the films. Uh, I would uh, better explain what what do we mean. Uh, in Russia, we had uh, we had a period of uh, of democratization uh, last year between the elections of the parliament and the elections of president. But then uh, the crackdown uh, started. Uh, I mean that. Uh, the civil society uh, felt uh, more and more, uh, started feeling more and more uncomfortable because uh, the uh, restricting laws were uh, passed uh, one after another um, because uh, the trials uh, started and many opposition activists are now on trial, some are on jail. We have a very uh, important uh, thing uh, like a Bolotnaya Square case, uh, I mean, the, I mean, the case, uh, there, were, there was a big uh, demonstration uh, last year in Moscow, uh, the day before uh, the inauguration of Vladimir Putin, and uh, 27 uh, participants of that demonstration were, uh, arrest, were arrested, and then uh, now they are uh, accused uh, of uh, preparing a mass uh, riot, uh, though it was a peaceful protest, and uh, now they are in jail. Uh, some are already con already convicted. Uh, they are sent. They some are already sentenced uh, to uh, five uh, years in prison. Some are all, others are, all, are still uh, waiting for the sentence. And uh, this uh, made uh, the civil society very frightened because uh, those people were just ordinary activists. Uh, they were not the leaders of, the, uh, of some parties or organizations. They were not the, uh, some of, most of them were even were not the members of some parties. They were just uh, ordinary citizens who, uh, some, and some of them were protesting for the first time uh, on the street. And that was uh, made to show uh, the civil society that anyone can be punished uh, for participating even in peaceful protest. But, uh, and Alexei Navalny, whom you mentioned, uh, he is one of the uh, main opposition leaders in Russia. He is now running for uh, the, uh, f he is participating in the election of Moscow mayor. We have the elections in September and uh, he is uh, he is now on trial, and we are waiting uh, uh, on trial. Uh, he he is accused of some uh, corruption cases, though uh, though she, she, he is uh, famous as the most uh, he is the most famous uh, corruption fighter in Russia. And uh, tomorrow we are waiting for the sentence, and uh, most of the people are. Uh, Thinking that it will be that he will be uh, found guilty, uh, but and yes, at the same time, uh, the federal TV channels are uh, showing uh, the f are showing the films uh, about the oppositioners as the foreign agents, as uh, the spies, as the enemies of uh, the people. And uh, but I think that less and less people are believing those films. Uh, because uh, when we had when we had uh, very mass protests, uh, there were hundreds thousands of people on the streets, and uh, in the big, c at least in the big cities, and not only in the big cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg, uh, every person had uh, some uh, acquaintance or friends or uh, relatives who were participating. And when uh, it is said from the TV that. Uh, all those people were uh, receiving money from uh, some foreign countries for uh, protesting. Uh, then uh, the people knows that people know that it is not true because uh, they were not receiving money because their relatives, their friends were not receiving money, and uh, so uh, the opposition uh, is trying to uh, build some. Uh, uh, alter to, to make some alternative uh, media, even on the lowest uh, level, I mean uh, that uh, 
there is a fund, for example, a fundraising project of uh, collecting money from local activists to uh, release a, a local newspaper about what's going on in your part particular district. And, uh, and I, I think that this is the, the hope for, uh, for us, that, uh, that, that we can hope that uh, less and less people will uh, believe uh, those, this propaganda and will uh, turn to different uh, sources of information, will uh, go online because the auditory of uh, Russian internet is growing very rapidly. And uh, in the internet, we still have some free media. Uh, you mentioned that you mentioned um, protests moving beyond Mo Moscow and St. Petersburg to local areas, and of course, and you yourself have chosen to get involved in in local politics as a way of activism. So, uh, how do you think this relates to the rest of the the political opposition in Russia? Um, to what extent is the opposition able to branch out beyond the urban middle class protesters? Uh, and and is are others in the opposition willing to really engage at the local level as you have? I'm also wondering how have you found your experience in local politics, and w will you consider running again after your current term ends? Mm -hmm. I would not consider my own uh, experience very uh, successful uh, because uh, the local deputies do not really have a lot of power and a lot of opportunities to change, uh, to influence on what is happening because uh, the, the, ones, the elected ones like me, they do not have uh, any real powers and at the same time the power is uh, in the hands of uh, those ones who are appointed from, uh, from above. Uh, and uh, they can make, they really make decisions. And uh, besides that, uh, the, our council consists of, uh, of 12 deputies, and most of the councils consist of uh, from 10 to 12 uh, to 20 deputies, and uh, most of them are the members of the ruling party, United Russia. So uh, there are only two oppositioners in my uh, council, and even if when we vote, we cannot really uh, influence on the uh, final decision. But uh, we can make uh, the work of the local authorities more transparent, and that is the goal. Uh, we can uh, write uh, in our blogs, we can invite uh, local activists, invite uh, the press to the meetings of the councils. And uh, I think that... Uh, if we promote the proper idea of uh, participating in uh, local elections, in uh, elections uh, of, uh, of the city parliament or of uh, the uh, local council or something like this, uh, then uh, if, uh, for example, if I had, if there were uh, not two but uh, five of us, we could influence on every decision. And if... Uh, as for the next term, it depends from uh, it depends on many factors, but uh, most of all, it depends on whether I will be uh, successful to find a team uh, to uh, participate in that election with me. Because if we are elected in, as a team, then we will have real uh, opportunities to change something. And yes, I think that this should be uh, the, main, uh, the main idea of, for the opposition to show that we are not only protesting, but we also have some uh, answers on the questions, on the requests, that, uh, on the demands that people have. Uh, we, that we know we are not only against uh, the situation as it is, but we know how to change it. And to show that we know how to change it, we must uh, start from the very low level and uh, start helping people and start uh, uh, winning their uh, votes. Hmm. Uh, so um, thank you, Vera. So Vera is speaking about you know the difficulties. Um, even once you win an election or win a, you know, some presence in elected bodies of, you know, how to make things happen and how to build toward, toward change. So, Glanis, 
let's talk about the, the electoral issue regarding Zimbabwe because uh, Zimbabwe will be holding parliamentary elections shortly, the end of the month, uh, in a poll called by uh, Robert Mugabe's ZANU PF, and it's much earlier than when the opposition wanted elections to be held. Uh, and there have been questions, including in a report last week by the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights about whether it's possible to hold free and fair elections in Zimbabwe in light of continuing human rights violations. Uh, people are concerned about a repeat of the kind of violence that took place at the time of 2008 elections. So how do you see this? How do you expect elections to happen? And what reforms would be necessary to establish a level playing field for the political parties? Um, I'm actually glad that we are having this meeting today on the 17th, um, two days after the special um, vote has just ended back home. Um, this is a vote that was done for uniformed forces who will be on duty on the day of the election. And it also includes um, the voting of the people from the Electoral Commission who will be manning um, <coughs> the polling stations on the election day. And so these people have already voted on the 14th and 16th of this, uh, 14th and 15th of this month. And I think from, from what we've seen from that trend of voting already, it's clear that um, we are not going to have a free and fair election in Zimbabwe. Uh, with one of the presidents having been the fact that um, the Electoral Commission printed one and, uh, 120 ballot papers for the uniformed forces and members of, of the commission. And out of the 120, they uh, came out on national media to say that 60,000 people out of the 120 are the police force, and they were scheduled to vote on 14 and 15. But the Treasury came out to say that the legitimate number of police officers that they have are only 40,000. So already there's a precedence that the election is going to be manipulated because we really wonder where the 20,000 um, forces was going to come from. And I think um, with what has also been happening early this year when the talk of the election intensified, I think it's been clear that um, ZANU-PF is not going to intimidate people like they used to do in 2008 and the other previous elections. They're not going to engage in overt violence where they'll physically um, beat up people, uh, take people to their bases. But I think they are going to engage more subtle ways of, of violence where um, outside it would seem as if we're having a free and fair and a violence-free election. And I think they are doing this in order to portray an image um, into a certain image to the international community, especially considering that our country in August is, going, is hosting, together with Zambia, a United Nations uh, World Tourism Conference. So I think it's quite deliberate. It's well planned to the extent that we may not see the violence that we saw in 2008, but obviously there are mechanisms really around um, ensuring that the election is stolen, people are intimidated and are not going to vote out um, in numbers. And I think we've also seen a precedence where uh, during the voter registration exercise, people were frustrated. People woke up as early as 4 a.m. to go and register to vote. And the people at the registration offices deliberately delayed um, responding to people who wanted to register to vote. Because where this registration was happening is where also the other registration happens for birth certificates, for death certificates, and so forth. And so people were frustrated by the times they were meant to, to, spe uh, to stand in the long queues. And some people ended up going back home, to, uh, going back to their homes without necessarily registering to vote. And I think it's one other way that has shown us that it was quite clear that um, ZANU-PF is trying to engage in certain ways to ensure that this election um, is stolen and that people who want to, to vote are able to vote accordingly. And I also want to say that uh, in terms of expecting how this election is going to come out, I think what we've also seen in the state media portrays the fact that uh, the election is biased, where um, the national state television and mainstream newspaper, The Herald, are always speaking about ZANU-PF. 
they are playing ZANOPF jingles about how ZANOPF liberated the country, about how ZANOPF gave them land, and we are not seeing anything from the opposition. And where the opposition parties are coming in, we are hearing stories about how bad they are, how terrible they have manipulated women and girls. And so it's, it's, it's kind of clear that really we are not going to have um, a balanced uh, view in terms of participants, uh, sorry, of um, the electorate having to know more about what they want to know from the various uh, candidates who are going to contest in the next election because uh, the opposition uh, parties are not given um, space on the national television. And then in terms of reforms that would have been necessary to level the playing field, I would say that we would have really loved to have uh, media reforms to ensure that all the participating parties are given enough chance to say out to the electorate what they are going to offer them come election time. And unfortunately, this hasn't been done. And also, we remain, to, we remain having two extreme ends where uh, we have independent media focusing more on, on one party and the state focusing more on the other. And at the end, because they are trying to shrink the space as much as possible, the ZANOPF were then having the police intimidating the opposition who are speaking much against uh, the ZANOPF regime as much as they are doing to the opposition. And I think the other uh, reform that would have also expected um, would have been the security sector reform. And you may have heard that in 2008 we had lots of uh, militia bases where people were taken, people were supposed uh, expected to be from opposition or whose um, spouses maybe were from supporting, clearly supporting the opposition parties. They were taken from their communities and taken to these bases where they were be, uh, beaten, young women were raped, uh, there were all sorts of things that were done to, to people uh, suspected to be opposition supporters at these bases. And most of the people who were manning these bases were actually um, people who are said to be, who works, uh, people who are said to be state agencies, people like the police, like uh, junior soldiers, and so forth. And so one of the things really we expected prior to having this election on the 31st would have been to have... Um, leaders within the security agencies declaring that they are not going to be partisan, that they are not going to victimize people to support certain political parties, or that they are not going to do anything to people who openly um, support po uh, political parties of their choices. But unfortunately, this is just one thing that uh, has remind, remained a nightmare. And the commissioner of police together with the army uh, leadership, they've actually come out to say that they are not going to support um, any leadership that has no war credentials. So this is one thing that is quite clear that um, the election, yes, we are having it, we really want to have it, but it's not going to be free and fair. And the playing field is not even level. And I think the other reform that would have also expected could have been um, the cleaning of the voters' rule. Um, there's an audit that has just been done. That it, I think it was concluded last week that uh, showed that slightly above 2 million people, some of whom we went on a drive to encourage to go and register to vote, have just been removed from the voters' rule. And slightly above a million people have, who are, some of them who are dead, some of them who are below the legitimate um, age to vote, people who are below the age of 18 are on this voters' rule. And it also came out that um, there are a lot of women who are known to be married uh, in certain communities, and these women have not changed their surnames, but on the voters' rule, their surnames have been changed to their husband's surname. So this is quite clear that we are going to have challenges when people go to register to vote on the 31st of, of, of July, where these women will be told that, ah, okay, the name that we have has got a certain surname, and what we are seeing in your, on your national ID is not what, what, what is here. So these women are likely to face challenges to be able to vote, and we are even worried about the 2 million that we encouraged to register to vote, and they went out and registered to vote, but now they are no longer in the voters' row. So I, I think basically there are quite a number of... Um, of reforms really that would have expected in order to make this election a free and fair election and in an even environment, but unfortunately that has not happened. But still we have hope that those who are on the voters' row will still be able to go out and, and vote in order to try and make sure that any other further mishaps that may happen, it will be difficult for the NOPF to manipulate those figures and um, act as if they've won the election when 
they may not have won that election. Um, Glennis, you, you, you listed a number of things that you expect to see happen um, and that you, that you already have seen happen. The efforts to depress voter registration, uh, media bias, uh, tampering with voter rolls, uh, abuses by, by security officers and so forth. And you also mentioned subtle forms of violence that you thought would be practiced um, that would be somehow under the radar or would not be obvious to outsiders uh, for whom the government would try to project the image of a free election. Could you give us an idea of some other things sort of to be looking out for as we read the news reports and so forth coming out of Zimbabwe surrounding the elections? What are these subtle forms of violence that you're speaking of? Um, I, I think one of the things really that's quite clear is that um, because there are a lot of civil society organizations, including ourselves, um, that have been accredited by the electoral body to do voter education, it's most likely that we are going to be targeted when we get into these communities. We will just be asked not to do this because we are not uh, part of the electoral commission. And if we are quite unfortunate, this may go to an extent of abductions, silent abductions, where no one knows what happened to you. All they know is you've just gone to a community to do voter education and you just disappear just like that. Then I'm also afraid um, that there's going to be a crackdown on, on civil society organizations where uh, we are going to be raided. Um, like we've begun to see early this year where um, some other organizations were actually raided and the police tried even to break into these offices after um, working hours. And this is also likely to happen as we near the election time. And the other most obvious would be uh, the fact that we may be not be allowed to operate in these communities. So we are actually prepared to work underground because with our experience from 2008, there's a time when the uh, police made it very difficult for CSOs to get clearance to conduct meetings. Uh, so even if we are a legal, legally registered organization and you want to conduct activities in certain communities, there is a law that requires us to first notify the police that we will be conducting this meeting at a certain venue at this time. And the police sort of like misread the law to say that they are supposed to give us clearance. So whether we like it or not, they will say we need to give you clearance. And if you don't have the clearance, you can get arrested for violating the Public Order and Security Act. So there's a very likelihood that we are not going to get this clearance. And when we don't get the clearances but still feel that we need to go and do the work, we are likely to be, to be arrested. And even to end up not being allowed to conduct these activities. So we are so much prepared to, to go and work underground because it's something that we, 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 we have interacted with in many instances and are really looking forward that that's one other extreme measure that uh, ZANOPF is going to engage to ensure that uh, we do not participate in terms of uh, encouraging people to go and register to vote and also to, to vote wisely in the next election. And then I think another subtle way would be intimidating people in the communities um, what we have seen, um, I think, from late last year was people within um, Zanopia leadership structures in the communities going out and telling people that when the time to vote comes, you need to know where to vote for, lest you find yourself no longer living in this community. So this is already something that has started happening in some areas, and we see a likelihood of that um, happening at a large scale where people will just be threatened. And because people are still so scared about what happened in 2008, it's quite possible that they will just say that word and, and, and people will be intimidated enough to participate in this election. And one other thing that has already been clear is that um, th there's a strategy that, that we, we read that um, what, what the NOPF structures are doing is they are writing people, uh, they are writing lists of how they expect people to go and vote. So each village head organizes the people under him in a certain way that he expects them to go and vote. And they are being told that we know which number you are and we know where you would have voted. We'll look at your vote and see where would you have voted because we have a tag of you. So people who are likely to, to, to be intimidated by such kind of... Um, of threats, but what we have done when we, had, we read about this was to also go back to the communities and just tell them that their vote is a secret and no one is going to have access uh, to the ballot boxes and see what, uh, who they would have voted for. But this is also one other threat um, that uh, ZANOPF is likely to employ as we near the election.
And I think, lastly, maybe uh, what could also be used, especially against women, would be the fact that they would just be told that we'll do what we did in 2008, and most women still have horrific experiences from 2008 where they have seen young women and, and women being game rubbed at this basis. So I think it's one other tactic that they are also going to use um, as we go to this election. So in light of all this, and then in addition to that, in light, you, there are all these, these obstacles, these abuses. Um, in addition to that, you're going out to rural communities, to young women and uh, who, you know, are, have, are participating in, you know, in, in farming and mining and, you know, in difficult work just to, just to earn a living, just to put food on the table. How do you persuade them to go beyond that to get involved in political activity? Yeah, yeah. Like I said earlier that um, your lived realities inform your actions and your thoughts. I think one observation that communities are beginning to realize is that you cannot separate the politics of the stomach from the general politics. I think Zimbabwe has just gone through so much in the past decade that people have begun to realize that some of the things they are told on a daily basis about how bad sanctions have been to Zimbabwe, about how bad Western countries have hated Zimbabwe and imposed sanctions on them is not true because they have really suffered when they saw these same people who say they have been imposed sanctions on living lavish lives. So I think people have began to realize that it's not just so much about what you eat, but it's also so much about what that person who is supposed to provide a conducive environment is doing in order to ensure that uh, those people are getting what they deserve to be getting. I actually want to emphasize that when, when we started the organization, one of our key entry points has been economic development. And one of the key questions that we've always received from our young women members are that, yes, we are doing business training, and you're going to support, um, support us to conduct uh, um, income generating initiatives, what guarantee do we have that we don't just wake up those stores having been taken just simply because we do not possess as an OPF card? What guarantee do we have that when we go to the election, all the money, all the energy that would have invested in those uh, initiatives will not just be bent up just because we are working with, with civil society organizations? So this is one of the key issues that has naturally opened space for us to begin to interrogate issues of human rights and, gov and democracy and, govern uh, and good governance without necessarily imposing them on the people, but people just to question them and say, we need a conducive environment that we know if we are doing businesses, our businesses will not be taken. So that, that has sort of like leveraged the playing field to us to the extent that we've been able to to uh, then openly uh, create that connection between the politics of the stomach and the politics of the day. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Glanis. Um, uh, Rosa Marie, I want to uh, turn back to you once more. Um, and I, I want to give you a chance to say something about Harold Cepero, uh, the activist on, on whose behalf you are accepting this award. So he was a leading activist in the youth wing of the Christian Liberation Movement and uh, killed in this tragic and suspicious car crash along with your father, who uh, was Cuba's most prominent dissident. So what can you tell us uh, about Harold, uh, about his work, his relationship with your father, and uh, what you think he would say if he were able to accept this award in person? Well, Harold was one of the freer and full of, full of love person that I ever know. He, he has this great personality that everybody gets like a little in love with him, but he also at the same time was always worried about what is going on with the others. He, he felt the calling of working uh, for the liberation of, of his Cubans brothers and sisters very early. He was expelled from the university for the dean in cell 13 years ago because he was uh, trying to explain the Varela project in, in his own faculty. And then and now, the Cuban government policy cannot deal, cannot tolerate 
this kind of free and spontaneous participation. The Haro dedicate, actually dedicate his life uh, to work for for the democracy in Cuba. I think that if he were here, he once again raised his voice to ask for support to the demands of the Cuban people, to the demands of the Varela Project, which, are, which is a, an initiative of law that is looking for change the law based on the Constitution to guarantee some basic political and civic rights that we don't have. I, I think that Harold speak about trying to stop repression in Cuba. The repression from the state security in my, cro in my country is, is getting worse. The provoked death of my father and my friend is the, maybe is the most painful example, but it's not the only one. The state security have ordered beatings to the member of our movement, but not just our movement, movement to the member of the opposition in general. And this indicates a very dangerous rising of the violence against the democratic movement. But the repression in my country is not just against the opposition. The, the repression in my country is against the whole Cuban people. I mean, the worker that wakes, wakes up early in the morning to go to work and he returns to his home with less than $2 in his pocket. To, to feed his family is being repressed. The, the exiled who live maybe in Miami and live with fear because it's fearing that the Cuban government uh, don't renew his passport and maybe he, he couldn't go to visit his mom, for instance, who lives in, in the island. It's being repressed also, but the million of people who live in Cuba and haven't participated in a free election for more than a half century right now because our electoral law has just one candidate for one position in the parliament, we are all being repressed in some way. And against this repression, Harold Severo rise, take his voice and put his body in the middle. I mean, the proposal in which Harold was worked, his courage, his spontaneous and free attitude, I suppose that became too dangerous to the present. Um. Rosa Maria, Cuba's communist authorities um, are saying that they're carrying out reforms, uh, allowing citizens to establish small private businesses, and allowing some dissidents, including yourself, to, to travel abroad. So what's going on here? How do you understand what's going on? Do you think there's an intention to adopt a kind of China model uh, in Cuba in which citizens would enjoy economic freedoms and higher living standards, but the Communist Party would stay in control? Or, or, what, else, or what do you think is, is going on with this new discourse of reform? Well, with, with the scenery that I just speak about, we can realize that Cuban government is not making democratic changes. The Cuban government today is trying to wash its image, making these limited reforms, pushing with uh, their lobbies into the center of powers of the world. Let us 
go out to the island. But what they haven't do yet is to recognize the human rights or to answer the demands that the Cuban people has already done. I mean, why they don't make a plebiscite in Cuba? Why don't they ask to the people, do you really want these changes? Do you really, do you really want that the law change to guarantee free expression, free association, free election, to the political prisoners get the liberation, to have real, but not like a privilege, like a, like a right to have private enterprises. Because we have to understand that all these reforms in Cuba are also designed as mechanisms of control, I mean. The Cuban person who can have an enterprise is a privilege, one. So he cannot start to talk about free expression or to deal with uh, the opposition movement because he's going to lose that privilege. And we are not talking about a privilege to to maybe get rich. We are talking about a privilege to survive. So these reforms, not just the economical, also the, the migratory reforms, always let in the Cuban government the possibility to decide who can actually access to this privilege. And it's a very twisted situation, but it's what we got. In first place, Cuban government haven't recognized the human rights. And there is no reason to not recognize the human rights in Cuba. In second place, the repression against the Cuban people and the member of the opposition is rising. So there is not a change in Cuba. And to the international community to bite this uh, strategy for the government could be very dangerous for us. There is some things that are already uh, very, that are already in, over the table. These things are the demands of the people. The Varela project was, or count with more than 25,000 of signatures, that people that inside the culture fear in Cuba dared to sign a project and with their names, with their address, with the ID numbers, they tell to uh, the government in Cuba, we want change, and we want that you discuss this and answer us. And there is not a reason to the Cuban government haven't answered yet. So if the international community wants help us, international community should look to the demands of the people, not to the signs of the government, which are very twisted, <laughs> but to the demands of the Cuban people, which are clear. Are in the Barrera project in a very organized and concrete way, but not just there. Uh, the opposition movement uh, inside and out the island has, we are agree, or we agree in, in one point, we have the same objective, because our objective right now is democracy. Maybe when we, when we uh, get access to democracy, we are going to have another objective, because we are going to have uh, legal parties, and we are going to play it in a democracy like any other democratic country. But right now, we are a step before. We are trying to get this democracy. So we are united in this platform called the path of the people, which is a vision of the transition process. And the path of the people have these few steps, but very concrete and elemental steps. And in first place, it puts the recognition of the human right, but also, also a dialogue, because we have to sit on, around the table and talk and decide what, is, what we want for Cuba. And in this table, the Cuban government is one of the invited. 
but it but cannot be the only one. And we have to ha to to have the human rights first, because if we don't have the human rights in the law and in the practice, the Cuban government is going to choose who is going to be in that table and what what they are going to say in that table. So we have this roadmap. We are. Uh, we are maybe for first time, it's not the only effort during our history, but we are agreed in this platform, in this unified platform called the Path of the People. Maybe we are not, not we, maybe not, we don't have the same ideas about, uh, about the future, but we, but, but we agree with the human rights goals and with the democracy goals. We are not all doing the same thing, but we are all working for the same thing. And that seems, or these things are uh, explained in this brief paper called The Path of the People. Thank you, Rosa Marie. I think that's very interesting and a very valuable perspective on the, the whole idea of top-down reforms that are extended as a selective privilege and a, a mechanism of control rather than granted as a right to everyone. I'm reminded of um, something that uh, an activist in an Arab country said to me a number of years ago before the revolutions and so forth we've seen about uh, you know, attempts by some of the authoritarian governments to um, apply democracy with an eyedropper. You know, uh, and, uh, you know, it's, of, of course, it's, you know, it's not real in that case at all. Uh, we have, we're just about to wind up the panel. I think we have a few moments if anyone in the audience would like to ask one of our panelists a question. Uh, and we perhaps have a microphone available. So uh, is there anyone who would like to ask a question? Just uh, put up your hand or stand up. Okay. Uh, this gentleman here, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Ifti Harusin. I work for Voice of America, pastor to the Bad region. Uh, uh, we have a nine hours of live broadcast to the region. Uh, Lele Ismail comes from. I must say she must be brave and a courageous woman because everybody knows that the people open their eyes every morning to violence, and especially even uh, a polio uh, worker who administered drops to kids and children, they are being killed. And thousands of schools are blown up. So um, I appreciate uh, the recognition uh, for the award. My question is that in Pakistan, more than 60% uh, they say population is youth under 30 years of age. Um, they've been brimming out with confidence and they want to change. In your opinion, how we can capitalize on that change, not only in political terms, but also in social and other fields? And do you think uh, Pakistan need international support to, uh, uh, to utilize in, in, in a useful way the energy of the youth and give them a direction? Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for coming here and for your question. I agree with you that young people are now the largest uh, chunk of population in Pakistan. And the way we can uh, capitalize the population of young people in Pakistan is because young people are now shaping the present politics of Pakistan. They are shaping the future of the politics of Pakistan. So it's important, uh, in my opinion, it's important in Pakistan, not only in Pakistan, but around the world, that young people are engaged in political processes and democratic processes. They are engaged as partners, as equal partners. They're engaged as leaders, not just as beneficiaries of the programs or clients of the programs. But young people should be taken on and should be taken as their as partners and their aspirations and needs of young people should be addressed in the policies and programs of the of nationally as well internationally. And I think international community uh, should support Pakistan in uh, so that Pakistan is able to provide an enabling environment for young people of Pakistan because Pakistan is faced with the challenge of extremism and it's not just a challenge which Pakistan has to fight alone, but 
the whole world has to contribute towards building peace in Pakistan and to create an enabling environment where young people can get education, where they can get employment, and they can contribute towards the development of the country. One of the uh, important things which international community has to do is when it comes to uh, when it comes to relations between countries, it, it is important that political governments are strengthened by the international forces when they, where, where, when they make decisions where different countries are involved. Political governments should be taken on table because now it's key time to strengthen the political governments, the political bodies. Once the political bodies, political governments are strengthened in Pakistan, it will for long term, it will sustain democracy, and the, stab and, the, and the military of Pakistan will not be able to intervene in the political processes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gulalai. Um, I hope that all of you have, uh, have enjoyed this panel as much as I have. I must say, I feel really very privileged um, to have had this time uh, with the four of you. And uh, it's just terribly clear why the NED has chosen to give you these awards. Uh, you have an incredible combination, I think, of vision, uh, visions for your countries, and how to connect that to very practical and specific action on specific issues. Uh, so uh, I congratulate you on all the work that you've done on receiving these awards, uh, and uh, look forward to seeing the work you will all do in the future. We are going to now proceed to uh, a reception in this room. You're all invited to stay and to our award ceremony. So please do stay. But before you do that, join me in thanking our four panelists, Gulalai Ismail, uh, Vera Kachanova, um, Glanis, and also Rosa Maria. Thank you so much for your uh, for your comments during this panel and for all of your excellent work. Ladies and gentlemen, we are assembled here today for a very special event and despite the grandeur of this room, this will really be a very intimate and personal celebration and a tribute to the heroism and uniquely creative achievements of four outstanding young people, each of whom stands as a catalyst for freedom, including the fourth one who was tragically killed before he could truly complete his personal mission in the cause of human freedom. These are young individuals who have already accomplished near miraculous triumphs in moving their home countries toward recognizing the vital importance of free speech, honest elections, the right to assemble, and rule of law. In so doing, they have inspired their fellow citizens to embrace democratic principles and stand up for human rights. We are here to salute them, to celebrate them, to thank them for the boldness of their vision, the audacity of their actions, and the stirring example of human courage they provide for all of us. My name is Judy Shelton. I'm Vice Chair of the Board of Directors of the National Endowment for Democracy. And it is my great pleasure to introduce one of the most passionate and effective leaders on democracy and human rights in the U.S. Congress. Ileana Ross Leitonen has always made it a priority to speak out on behalf of people struggling for freedom around the world. She is a former chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the current chair of the Middle East and North Africa Subcommittee. It is my great honor to ask Congresswoman Ross Leitonen to come up to the podium and offer her remarks. Thank you. And I'm going to keep my uh, remarks uh, brief because there's nothing worse than a form or something. Uh, we have the current chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee in the U.S. Senate, Bob Menendez, here with us, a great defender of freedom, democracy, and human rights. 
but Bob and I are so thrilled to be here for this uh, 30th anniversary of the National Endowment for Democracy, and I am, I am awed when I see these uh, wonderful young ladies and uh, what they represent. I'd like to commend Carl, everybody's friend, the president of NED, for his tireless commitment, for his dedication to advancing democratic principles and supporting the voices of those living under repressive regimes. We are uh, gathered here to present the 2013 Democracy Awards to young activists from Zimbabwe, from Pakistan, from Russia, and from my native homeland of Cuba that, who are leading the effort to bring, help bring freedom and democracy to their nations. Unfortunately, one activist cannot be with us uh, today. Harold Sapero was one of the leaders of the Christian Liberation Movement in Cuba. And almost exactly one year ago today, on July 22, 2012, Harold was killed under suspicious circumstances in a car accident in Cuba alongside another great democracy advocate, uh, activist, Osvaldo Paya, whose daughter, Rosa Maria, is joining us today. Thank you, Rosa Maria, for everything that you're doing. We're fortunate enough to uh, have her with us. Uh, she's a brave young woman. She's, she's so young. All of these... Uh, all of these girls are, are, uh, are amazing. Uh, and Rosa Maria, whom I've had the pleasure of knowing for a little bit longer than these other three champions of freedom, has called for numerous investigations into the suspicious deaths of her father and Harold, even though her family has been threatened repeatedly by the thugs in, uh, in Cuba. In Russia, it was disappointing to see the verdict last week posthumously of Sergei Magnitsky. Sergei, as uh, we know, was uh, an advocate who was uh, uh, detailing uh, what was going on with corruption in Russia. And uh, after beating him to death, then they tried him and they found him guilty. This unjust action by Vladimir Putin and his cronies proves yet again that individuals can get away with blatant human rights abuses in Russia. The U.S. must be on the side of the Russian people and add more names immediately to the Magnitsky list to hold these corrupt officials accountable and stand side by side with the pro-democracy activists such as Vera, who is with us today, who's a journalist who fights for transparency at the local level. And last week, I led a bipartisan letter in the House addressed to our Secretary of State, John Kerry, expressing concern over the escalating violence and intolerance toward religious minorities in Pakistan. And that's another country whose uh, young heroine we're uh, uh, honoring to her. So thank you. Gulalai, did I get close? More or less. Listen, my name is so difficult. I, I never get upset if people don't know how to say my name. Uh, but thank you, Gulalai, for uh, helping young women in Pakistan be involved in the political process because they will soon be the future leaders of, uh, of your country. And uh, I would also like to thank Glanis for her role in helping women reach their full potential in uh, financial and agricultural fields in Zimbabwe. What an amazing uh, group of young ladies we have. I agree with you that we have to do more uh, to strengthen democracy and, and have free elections in Zimbabwe to reach our goal of a free, transparent, and more open society. These uh, four brave women are role models who truly illustrate the hard work and the dedication that is vital. They're vital to improve uh, today's world. Uh, they made the choice to be engaged. They made the choice to be active. They made the choice to lead the cause for freedom and democracy that many of us take for granted every day. Uh, through the work of NED, and I can't say enough wonderful things about all the people involved with NED, we will stand united in solidarity and support your courageous efforts for democracy. Thank you, young ladies, and I would be honored to take a picture with you there if I could. Carl and Bob, could you join me here for a second? Thank you.
Well, we give our, our special thanks to Congresswoman Ileana ross -Layton, and um, Her comments really come from the heart. That's, that's very obvious, and she fights for what she believes in, and we're very, very pleased that she believes so much in the NED. It is my great pleasure at this time to introduce a gentleman who has long fought for the values we celebrate today as we honor the four outstanding recipients of the 2013 Democracy Award. Senator Robert Menendez is chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And since his days in the House of Representatives, he has been a powerful advocate for supporting the democratic aspirations of people around the world. And we're honored that he could be with us here today. Mr. Chairman, please. Well, thank you very much. And I'm um, uh, always thrilled to be here with the National Endowment for Democracy advocating freedom across the globe, and uh, to follow uh, my dear friend Eliana Roslatinen, who is a, a dynamo in her own right, and has the best picture collection of anybody I know in the United States Congress, as is evidence. Uh, I want to thank the endowment for their invitation and for their work every day in promoting democracy across the world, and Carl and you and all of the board members. And it's an honor to be here with all of you who work so hard for the values we hold dear to see the future of democracy in the faces of tonight's honorees, um, those who are here to accept this award, and one courageous young man who gave his life for freedom. Tonight, tonight's honorees give us hope for a world without corruption and discrimination, a world where equality, justice, and political tolerance are available to all. To Glanis uh, Shong Ashi Rei Rei, founding director of the Institute for Young Women's Development in Zimbabwe, to uh, Gulali Ismail, providing leadership to young women in northwest Pakistan, to Vera Kachanova, uh, fighting for transparency as a member of Moscow's Municipal Council, and to the late Harold Cepero of Cuba's Christian Liberation Movement that organized the Varela Project, a citizen movement to establish democracy in Cuba. Uh, Harold Cepeda was a rising leader in Cuba's growing political opposition, uh, one of its unsung democratic heroes who, along with Oswaldo Payá, was killed under suspicious circumstances in what was supposedly, allegedly, an automobile accident on July 22nd of last year. We are honored uh, today, as we approach the first anniversary of that tragedy, to welcome the daughter of Oswaldo Payá, Rosa Maria Payá, to accept the award on behalf of Harold Sapero. And I want Rosa Maria to be assured uh, that the world will not forget, I will not forget, uh, and the legacy of your father and Harold uh, will be carried on. His dream will one day become a reality, and there will be freedom and democracy in Cuba. Right now, however, we need to work towards that dream by holding the Castro government accountable for their actions we need an independent international investigation into the incident that night in Cuba a year ago. And I am proud to have joined my colleagues, Senator Durbin and Rubio, Senator Nelson, Cardin, and McCain, calling on the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to carry out an international investigation into the mysterious circumstances surrounding the death of Oswaldo Payá and Harold Zapero. We in the family of democratic nations, in the name of transparency, owe them no less. Tonight's honorees take their place next to past recipients, courageous young men and women who have come before them, Violeta Chamorro of Nicaragua, Vaclav Havel of the Czech Republic, and Cubans like Jose Daniel Ferrer Garcia, Jorge Garcia Perez Antunes, Ivan Hernandez Carrillo, Librado Linares Garcia, and Iris Tiamara Perez Aguila. They represent the power of youth, the courage of the next generation who believe in equal rights, in the rights of women, in justice, transparency, and the hope for freedom. They believe uh, in the right to a good education and for the opportunity for all to live in peace and build a better life for themselves and their families. So let us remember that that struggle for democracy requires more than the adoption of a few insignificant economic changes that give the appearance of freedom in an effort to deny the opportunity for real political change, what Oswaldo Payá in a Cuban context called fraudulent change. 
The struggle for democracy requires real, honest political change. And real political change requires the kind of courage we see represented in this year's honorees. The courage of the individual to stand up for what they believe is fair and just in the face of oppression and authoritarianism. A belief in the rights of the individual to pursue happiness as they choose to pursue it. That is the struggle we celebrate tonight. That is our hope for the future. And tonight's honorees are the embodiment of that hope. Congratulations to all, and my thoughts and prayers continue to be with Harold Sapero and Oswaldo Payat tonight and every night until the people of Cuba are free. Thank you to Carl and to everyone at the National Endowment for Democracy and in the NED family, the NDI, the IRI, the CIP, the Solidarity Centers. Uh, I uh, urge you to keep up the great work that you do. And I want you to know, as the chairman of the Center for Foreign Relations Committee, that you have our hand in friendship and the power of our office to help you promote the democracy and freedom throughout the world. Thank you very much for having me with us. The fact that Senator Menendez would take time to be here with us today to honor these four awardees and the power of the words he just spoke uh, testifies to the senator's own deep commitment to supporting freedom and democracy around the world. I feel very privileged to co-host, along with Carl Gershman, president of the National Endowment for Democracy, the program for this evening. Beyond honoring the four individuals who have done so much to advance democracy in their own nations, we are also paying tribute to their compatriots around the world, the millions of youth activists who have fought for liberty, for justice, for human dignity, and human decency. Some of them paid with their lives to attain these goals. Some went to jail or were fired from their jobs or kicked out of university. Freedom does not come for free. We know that. And that's why the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy, on behalf of the American people, has been acknowledging with great respect for many years the courageous and creative work of individuals who have advanced the cause of human rights and democracy in the world. In fact, this November marks our own 30th anniversary as a force for freedom, the 30th year since we began our partnership with those individuals and organizations dedicated to strengthening civil society through democratic institutions. They help us recognize and reaffirm the fundamental values on which our own nation was built. Wherever citizens resist tyranny, wherever people are brave enough to challenge authoritarian rule when it denies equal rights, equal justice, equal treatment under the law, wherever someone takes personal responsibility for building the foundations of a free society, that is where NED stands ready to help. We are morally bound to these people and these organizations who fight for freedom. The small grants we provide are a mere token of the esteem we hold for democracy activists. We are humbled by what they do even as our, we are reminded of the sacrifice our own forebears made to secure the blessings of freedom. You people remind us that it's worth it, but it's also a battle that never ends. Freedom requires eternal vigilance, and the consequence of forgetting that is servitude. I'd, I'd like to draw your attention to these four statuettes lined up beside me. Uh, for my money, they are much more beautiful than the Oscars that are presented at the Academy Awards each year. Now, people who win Oscars may be gifted and talented, but they are only acting out extraordinary roles. These people are living them. They are defining them in real life with real consequences, and they are confronting real risk, and they are making a real difference. The NED Award 
is a small-scale replica of the goddess of democracy that was constructed spontaneously in Tiananmen Square in Beijing during the youth movement of 1989 for freedom and democracy. The art students who created the 10-meter tall sculpture from plaster, foam, and paper mache signed a declaration to go with it that said, Goddess of Democracy, you are the symbol of every student in the square, of the hearts of millions of people. The people's goddess stands tall and announces to the whole world a consciousness of democracy has awakened. As a symbol of the people's hearts, she is divine and inviolate. Let those who would sully her beware. Long live the people. Long live freedom. Long live democracy. So now as we reflect on the achievements and sacrifices of those in times past who faced off against authoritarian government and menacing tanks to defend the ideal of democracy, we should take heart in recognizing the courage of our outstanding youth activists today. They are the continuing legacy of democracy, and they are its future. We've been very honored to have two distinguished members of Congress join us in paying tribute to our awardees. And I know we're all anxious to proceed with that ceremony. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors for this event. The Hereford Foundation has generously contributed to honoring pro-democracy youth activists. Bob Miller. Bob, would you please stand up? <laughs> Bob Miller is the chairman. He is the chairman of the Hereford Foundation. He has been a very devoted NED board member and served as our treasurer. Thanks so much, Bob, for your, your devotion and your steadfast commitment. I would like to acknowledge as well the support of Ambassador Robert Tuttle, who served with great distinction as U.S. Ambassador to the United Kingdom and is our current treasurer at NED. We have a number of other individuals and organizations who have contributed generously, and they are named in the printed program. We gratefully acknowledge their support. You know, these days it, it seems difficult oftentimes to find something that everyone in the Congress, both House and Senate, can agree on. But there's no question when it comes to recognizing the bravery, the ingenuity, and the determination of these democracy activists, the feelings of admiration are wholly bipartisan. Great. Thank you. This is another great honor. We are very fortunate to be joined this evening by another close friend of the endowment, Congressman Mario Diaz Balart. A member of the Appropriations Committee, Congressman Diaz Balart takes a strong interest in the work of the NED and its grantees around the world. We're grateful for his leadership on democracy issues and so pleased that you are here tonight to honor the 2013 Democracy Award recipients. Thank you so much. I will, uh, I will be very brief. Um, as I'm sure you've heard, they've called votes, so I, we all have to run over there now. I, I do want to, though, however, uh, on this is the 30th, 30th anniversary of NED. Uh, really, I just thank NED and all of you um, for honoring these four very special um, individuals, very special individuals who, who are heroes to all of us uh, who love freedom, and I think to the world, for individuals that the world can look to uh, as shining examples of, by the way, great sacrifice and great pain, but true heroes. I, I'm reminded by, uh, if I may just quote, if my eyesight will permit me, uh, President Ronald Reagan uh, from Westminster in his address in 1982, which, you know, which led really to, to the NED's founding a year later. Uh, let me quote President, uh, President Reagan. The objective I propose is quite simply, uh, it's quite simple, to state to foster the infrastructure of democracy, the system of a free press, unions, 
political parties, universities, which allows a people to choose their own way to develop their own culture, to reconcile their own differences through peaceful means. When you think of that goal, which Ned exemplifies and lives by, and then you look at the four individuals that are being honored by Ned, it's very clear that Ned has never forgotten its purpose, its goal. And I, I could go on forever about these four individuals, but I will, because time is, unfortunately, I have to run for these votes. So I do want to just mention Harold Cepero. You know, the young leader, a brilliant young leader of the uh, Cuba's, Cuba's Christian Liberation Movement. The group uh, that are organized the Varela Project, somebody who spent so much time and effort uh, with uh, Mr. Paya. Uh, and he gave his life, uh, gave his life uh, for freedom, for that movement of freedom. And to be able to be here with all of you and with Osvaldo's daughter, who I've had the uh, pleasure privilege and honor uh, to meeting recently is an honor uh, that I will never forget. So thank you, Ned. Thank you, Carl. Thank all of you uh, for keeping the spirit of what Ronald Reagan talked about alive, for honoring four great individuals who deserve the recognition, who deserve, deserve uh, our thanks, our admiration, and our devotion and must never be forgotten. So thank you very much, and I apologize that I have to go run and vote. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Congressman diaz Villar. Well, you know, these are busy times up on the Hill. So again, this is part of the tribute and the the respect for your work, and it's clear that it's deeply, deeply appreciated on both sides of the aisle, as we say here in Washington. In fact, the fact that this event is taking place on Capitol Hill tells you how much it means to us, not only as citizens of a nation that cherishes democratic values, but because you teach us, through your individual accomplishments, a great truth that the aspiration for freedom and the defense of human rights, those are universal values. So now, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you a little bit about our first recipient of the 2013 Democracy Award, our first honoree for this evening. Glanis Changachereri, please, please come up here with me. I would like to... Uh, formally introduce you to your many admirers, and together with Carl, we will present to you the Democracy Award. In her electrifying opening address at the Seventh Assembly of the World Movement for Democracy in Lima, Peru, this last fall, Gladys Changachereri described her upbringing in rural Zimbabwe. Like other peasant families, she recalled, my family relied on farming and struggled to fund my education. Although they tried very hard, it was not easy, with society dictating that the girl child is not worth investing in. As a result of her strong desire to receive an education, Glanis became interested in women's rights, and she would come to lead her own influential movement. She defied the norms of a highly patriarchal society by enrolling in university, and there she joined the Student Representatives Council as the only woman. She joined the student movement to fulfill her desire to prove that, and I'm quoting you, women are equal to our male counterparts and can equally represent their fellow students. Her activism had severe consequences and Glanis found herself incarcerated by police on numerous occasions. But she was not to be intimidated, knowing that she was fighting for the right to education and the improvement of the lives of girls and young women in a free Zimbabwe. In 2009, Glanis established the Institute 
for young women's development to provide a platform where, in her words, young women can organize and come together to live a life where they have a choice in how to lead their lives and have a sustainable livelihood. The organization educates young women about their human rights and encourages them to become involved in political activity. The Institute for Young Women's Development has empowered thousands of young women who now have an important ally in their quest for education and individual rights in Zimbabwe. As Glanis explains in a video documentary produced by the World Movement for Democracy, we need to be the masters of our own destiny. For her, her extraordinarily effective work on behalf of rural women and her deep commitment to the cause of a free and democratic Zimbabwe, the National Endowment for Democracy is proud to present the 2013 Democracy Award to Glanis Changachereri. I've never felt like this before. I want to say thank you to Ned, Carl and Tim. I respect you so much. Ned was our first grantee. We started working with volunteers without funding, but Ned came on board and they supported my work. And this work has grown far beyond ourselves, far beyond the people who are carrying this work. I want to thank Ned so much for the recognition, but I want to say that this is not my award. I'm accepting this award on behalf of the brave young women that I work with in the province of Mashonaland Land Central, back in Zimbabwe. Most people would call them poor young women, but for me, they are not poor. They are rich because they have the courage. They are brave enough to stand up and want to fight for their lives, to change their lives. I also want to receive this award on behalf of my family for eventually accepting me for who I am. It was not an easy journey, but today I want to say that the loneliness I used to feel in the cells, sleeping out at night in the trenches, is gone. Because my family have accepted that that's who I am and that they need to take me as their child. And I also want to receive this award on behalf of what others would call a partner or a husband. But for me, he's not a husband. For me, he's a best friend. He's a comrade to me. Somebody who would call on me and check up if I'll be getting home on time, lest he starts feeling that something has happened to me. Somebody whom I also check on if he has gone out to do his work, if he's still okay, or if something has happened to him. Thank you so much, Terence, for being such a comrade and a friend. I want to say to Ned, I'm very much honored, and I feel humbled to receive this award. And I want to dedicate it to 31 July, as this is a very important day in the life of many Zimbabweans. And this award, if I can hold it, Carl. I want to say this award represents what we want to see prevailing in Zimbabwe, 
post 31 July. And I'll take it with me as a symbol and the strength and the spirit that Zimbabwe needs as we go to the polls on 31 July. Thank you. All I can say is, uh, Glanis, we're, we're honored to recognize your magnificent work and your magnificent spirit. Our second recipient comes from a region of the world that has particular meaning for me, Russia. I studied the Soviet economy for many years and wrote a book about it in 1989 as a research fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Vera Kachanova had not even been born yet, but now at age 22, and as an elected member of the Municipal Council in Moscow, she is not only bringing democratic ideals to her native Russia, she is making democracy work for people. She's making government accountable and responsive to the needs of constituents. Vera, would you please join me at the podium? This young woman is a true original, utterly authentic in her individuality and her boldness. She may look soft and sweet, but she's tough and smart. Grassroots politics are always challenging in countries that crack down on civil society, and this is particularly so in Vladimir Putin's Russia, where peaceful demonstrators are hauled off to prison and organizations that receive outside support are smeared as foreign agents. But Vera Kachanova is part of a new generation of Russians who are challenging the system from within. After multiple arrests for participating in street protests, Vera nevertheless sought and won a seat on the city council last year that now enables her to connect directly with other Moscovites who are fed up with bureaucratic bullying and arrogant government. In her role as a councilwoman, Vera deals with neighborhood issues helping to improve the daily lives of people, whether it's creating more parking spaces, improving garbage collection, or fixing up neighborhood parks. But she has by no means abandoned the struggle to bring about large-scale political change. She sees change taking place incrementally as she and her fellow young activists take advantage of breaches in the iron wall built by the current regime and she places her insider role in a larger context, saying that this marks the beginning for her generation to train themselves to run the country. A libertarian by conviction, Vera believes in the primacy of individual liberty, political freedom, and voluntary association. And she dreams of a country in which, I'm quoting you, Drunk police officers no longer attack citizens. At the age of 14, Vera began writing for her local newspaper. She went on to work at the independent publication Novaya Gazeta, known for its investigative reporting and for its heroic journalists such as Anna Polakovskaya, who was murdered in the line of duty. As a journalism student in the same department where Anna studied, Vera was arrested at a Kremlin-organized event where young people were instructed to smile and clap for the visiting president. Guess what? She's not the sort who obeys such orders. In the 2012 municipal elections, Vera and her fellow opposition activists were not regarded as serious competitors. Campaigning door-to-door, -door, she promised to design a website giving constituents easier access to their deputies and the district's spending records. She won. Something tells me she will keep on winning. 
for her pragmatic idealism and her determination to help chart a democratic future for her country, the National Endowment for Democracy is delighted to present its 2013 Democracy Award to Vera Kichanova. I'm very pleased and I am very thankful for this award. I am very pleased to be here. We in Russia last year we had we had very massive protests and those wonderful people uh, who there were many th there were many thousands of them who were going out in the street, many of them for the first time, to show that uh, they want uh, the political system to be. Uh, more lib to be more liberal, to be more democratic. Uh, they all hoped that uh, the changes will come quickly. But actually, after that, we had a crackdown on the civil society in Russia. And so many of those people are discouraged, but they, uh, while they are discouraged, they doesn't, it doesn't mean that uh, they are giving up because we, continuing, uh, we are continuing our fight, our struggle, and at least we have seen that there are hundreds of thousands of people in Russia who demand the democratic changes, who want, the Russia, who want Russia to be a free country, who want free, the free election, who want the free media, uh, who want who want to change the country to the best and to, who want a free society, to build a free society. And I am very glad and I'm very pleased that there are people from other countries who are also democracy fighters who keep eye on what we are doing in Russia. And I am very pleased, uh, I'm very thankful to NED, uh, to National Endowment for Democracy, for the opportunity to see those people here uh, the activists, the brilliant activists who are fighting for the same ideals in their own countries. Uh, and this year, this award is given to young activists, and to my mind, uh, the youth plays a special role in the democratic movement. In Russia, it's the same. In Russia, it also plays a special role because the youth now are glob is global minded and young people are traveling all over the all over the world they they are connected with uh, the people of their generation from other countries and they know that that they want to live the russian youth they want know they they want to live in a modern country and uh, there is and now we have finally figured out that there is no modernization without uh, democratization and without uh, human rights. And I'm sure that uh, this award, that is not my award, it's the award of the generation of uh, young Russians who keep uh, fighting, who keep uh, protesting, who keep going out in the streets and participating in some local activities, participating in some local elections. and. I would like to dedicate this award to the ones who are now in jail in Russia for their political views and political activism, especially to those uh, 27 uh, people who are on trial uh, in Bolotne case. And I'm very thankful to National Endowment for Democracy. I'm very thankful to my comrades from the Libertarian Party of Russia because that was, uh, if speaking about uh, my uh, victory in, this, in that local election, it was not my victory, it was the victory of our whole team. And in, 
when the society when you live in a society in a country that is not free you cannot do anything alone you must work in a team you must build build some connections with other activists and so now we know that uh, our fight is not uh, that it, that now we are ready for a long distance uh, long distance fight uh, we are ready to um, we know uh, how to go on and we we are going to keep fighting thank you Thank you, Vera, for those very, really beautiful and moving remarks. And, you know, you give us hope. You really you give us hope. Before I read the tribute to Gulala Ismail, uh, I just want to thank Judy for her eloquence, for her leadership that she's shown on the net board, for her intellectual distinction, and especially for her really deep and passionate commitment to the NED's mission of supporting democracy all over the world. The great prominence that has been given to Malala Yousafzai, to Mukhtar Mai, to Benazir Bhutto, and other women in Pakistan, one of them is with us tonight, uh, Fauzia Saeed, who is a fellow at the NED, have given the impression that women have a strong voice in Pakistani politics and society. In fact, the vast majority of women have no voice at all in the decision-making in the family, in the community, and in, and in the nation. For that reason, Gulalai Ismail established Aware Girls 10 years ago when she was just 16 years old to provide young women with a platform for learning and for advocacy so that they could act as agents of empowerment in their communities, receive an education, and gain control over their lives. All around me, she said, I saw girls being treated differently from boys. And girls have internalized all this discrimination. A woman who suffers violence but doesn't say anything is much admired in the village as a role model. Aware Girls is a membership organization headquartered in Khyber Pukhtunwa, which is near the border with Afghanistan. It's a very violent region where women are especially ma marginalized. Aware Girls is expanding into other dangerous areas now, such as southwestern Baluchistan, and even in Afghanistan, where women's rights are also severely challenged. Gulai has brought maturity and intellectual and methodological clarity to her work. In contrast to the personality-driven, often dynastic politics of Pakistan's elites, Gulai has built Aware Girls using culturally sensitive peer-to-peer -peer outreach methods. The result has been a new paradigm of democratic leadership in Pakistan. Gulai is a leader who is not only talented and dynamic and articulate, but who also enables those around her to grow and to become better as well. The seminars, the workshops, the trainings organized by Aware Girls are invariably exciting and filled with energy and enthusiasm, with young women beginning to think about their role in the world in new ways. More recently, with the increasing involvement of young people in religious extremism, in Pakistan, Gulalai has created the Youth for Peace, the Youth Peace Network, 
to promote tolerance and to oppose violence. To those who say that the obstacles to democracy in Pakistan are too great to overcome, Gulalai has patiently explained with wisdom beyond her years that democracy is an evolving process in Pakistan and that change will come step by step if people continue to gain experience and don't lose perspective and hope. Gulalai has not just demonstrated great determination and vision in her work, but also immense courage. And so for her bravery and for her untiring efforts on behalf of Pakistan's young women and for her leadership in building a society where all people are treated with dignity and respect, the National Endowment for Democracy is proud to present its 2013 Democracy Award to Gulalai Ismail. Thank you so much. I want to thank the National Endowment for Democracy, who always believed in our power, in the power of young women to strengthen democracy. We started working with National Endowment for Democracy three years ago, and it was one of their few partnerships with young people. And we were very honored that they started working with us on strengthening democracy through increasing political participation of young women. I want to thank all the young women of Pakistan, especially Khyber Bukhtunkha province, who always stood by me, who always risked their lives so that they can stand by the rights, the political rights of young women in Pakistan. Young women in Pakistan, they're taking their role as active citizens, as voters, as politicians, as, uh, as critique of the political processes, they have been contributing to the political processes through many different ways. And today, I want to dedicate this award to all those young women who have always spoken for the empowerment of young women, for change, and for sustaining democracy in Pakistan. I believe that democracy and sustaining democracy is a slow process. We have to be patient about it. We should, if there are problems, it does not mean, like for example in Pakistan, it was said by many people that it is a failing democracy, but I believe that it is a strengthening democracy. It is an evolving democracy. Young people of Pakistan, they are coming forward. They are making politicians accountable. And in the previous elections, young people of Pakistan have proved that they have a very crucial, a very important role in shaping democracy and in shaping the future of their country. Young women, they are, I believe that young women, we are not victims, we are not just voters, we are not just public. We are the decision makers. We are decision makers of our country. We have the power to make decisions. We are, being women, we are not less than anyone. We are not less than intellectual. We are not less than being articulate. We can shape our country. We can make decisions of our country. And we, and we want all of you to believe in our power. And for today, I don't know that if it was pre-planned or if it's just a coincidence that all of the awardees are young women, but it has strengthened my belief that women all around the world, not just in Pakistan, but all around the world, women are playing key role in strengthening democracy and in strengthening political processes in the world. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I agree that freedom does not come for free. And we young women, we are, we are ready to stand by democracy. We can give our life, we can give our blood, we can give our intellect, our time, our resources, so that democracy and peace can sustain in the world. Thank you so much.
It's now my really great honor to read our tribute to Harold Cepero. According to a fellow democracy activist who knew him well, the late Harold Cepero was driven by three fundamental values, compassion for the persecuted and the needy, a thirst for truth, and an ability to forgive those who had mistreated him. Born into a humble family in Camagüey, Cuba's third largest city, Harold was drawn to the local Catholic church when he was in high school. My calling, he said, is to fight for my people. Knowing the dangerous consequences, he said that, of independent social and political activism in totalitarian Cuba. His activism took the form of working for the Varela Project, which was a citizen petition movement calling for a popular referendum to establish the foundation for a democratic system in Cuba. An initiative that was spearheaded by the Christian liberation movement led by Osvaldo Paya, the Varela Project collected over 25,000 signatures, which was a clear challenge to Cuba's dictatorship. And as a result of this work, of his work on this landmark initiative, Harold was expelled from the university for being a non-revolutionary and an opponent of Castro's regime. The Communist Party organized Harold's fellow students for an act of repudiation against him. And when many of them later came to him to apologize, he expressed no rancor toward them but rather extended to them a hand of forgiveness and understanding, and he called upon them to live in truth. Harold was deeply convinced that what he was doing was the right thing. He had the serenity that comes from a deep sense of mission. He entered the seminary the seminary after he was expelled with the intention of becoming a priest, but he eventually returned to the Christian liberation movement, which was a decision that would ultimately cost him his life. Last July 22nd, when he and Osvaldo Paya, along with two young Christian Democrats, from Europe were traveling in eastern Cuba to meet with other activists. Their car was rammed from behind by a red Lada with government license plates, according to the account later given by the Spanish driver, Angel Caramero. Both Harold and Paya were killed, though exactly how they died is still not known and can only be determined by an independent investigation. I learned today that it is believed that Harold and Paya were alive after the car was rammed. So we still want to understand how they died. Next Monday marks the first anniversary of what appears to have been a terrible crime that took the lives of two of the, the lives of these two valiant and noble individuals. A friend of Harold of Harold's recalls that on an organizing trip for his movement, 
The two of them were once at a bus station when a hungry man asked for money to buy food. Although they themselves had very little, Harold not only gave this man his own spending money, but also brought the man to the table to sit and to eat with them. Such was his compassion and his generosity of spirit. Harold has been called a sunrise for the Cuban nation. For his selfless devotion to the struggle for a free and democratic Cuba and in memory of the goodness that he brought to the world, the National Endowment for Democracy is proud to present its 2013 Democracy Award posthumously to Harold Sapero. But before I call Osvaldo Paya's daughter, Rosa Maria, here to receive this tribute on Harold's behalf, I would like us all to take a moment of silence in honor and in memory of these two brave and wonderful individuals. I now call upon Rosa Maria to come up to the podium to receive this tribute on behalf of Howard Chicago. It's my greatest honor to receive this prize in behalf of Harold Sepero, especially because I know that I shouldn't be here. The one that should be here is Harold, receiving all your smiles and all these honors. Harold lived with the peace of the men who act according with the commands of their hearts and trusting in God. He gave his life doing what he decided to do, and he decided to pursue his happiness and the happiness of the people around him, trying to give him to the people the human rights and the environment of peace and freedom. I would like that this recognition could be used to order all, all this solidarity, not just to remember Harold, also to act in favor of these things that Harold were looking for, act in favor of the democracy in Cuba, in favor of the demands of the Cuban people, which are very clear, in favor of the demand of plebiscite in my country. And also in favor of the implementation of the international investigation to really know what happens with my father and with Harold not just because Harold's families, my family, and our friends 
we deserve to know the truth. Also, because we want to stop this kind of, of acts that are taking place in Cuba. We need to stop this repression. And I'm sure that Harold would receive this prize also like a recognition of the rise of all Cubans to live in a free country. I'm sure that Harold Seber received this prize in behalf of his own partners in the opposition movement, not just the, the youngest one, but especially the young people, because he was always the one who delivered his complete time to speak and to explain to young people why they should be pursuing freedom and happiness in the way that they could choose. So I'm receiving this prize in behalf of, of Harold Sepero, like a recognition of his life, of, uh, like a recognition of his bravery, and like a recognition of the rise the right to the rights that Cuban people have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rosa Maria. I just want to note that uh, we're going to be sending an email out to everyone uh, who was invited to this event with a link uh, to a video that was done by uh, Orlando Luis Prado Lazo, who is with us tonight, and Rosa Maria uh, about Harold. A uh, very beautiful video. Um, it, the background music is Harold's favorite song by Aerosmith, Dream On and some video uh, that, he that he loved, but also there are many photographs of Harold uh, in this video, and I really would urge you all to, uh, to link on to it, uh, because what it shows is a young man who is just, as I think you can see from the photograph we have, and a really handsome uh, and wonderful uh, young man whose loss we, uh, we continue to mourn. I also want to note that on the, on the occasion of the NED's 30th anniversary, the NED is undertaking um, uh, a project called 30 Under 30, which will, uh, it's starting now with act, honoring these young activists, but will also continue by, portra by giving portraits uh, in video of activists that the NED supports who are fighting for democracy who are under 30, and will also profile NED grants uh, that are under $30,000 uh, a year, which I think also underlines uh, the cost effectiveness of what we try to do and how much uh, activists who are fighting for freedom around the world, how much they can accomplish uh, with, with relatively limited resources. The challenges that we've heard about from each of our awardees this evening vary in some ways the growing repression in Russia with the Navalny trial, uh, Magnitsky, and so forth, the violence and the clampdown that is preceding the coming election in two weeks in Zimbabwe, the marginalization of women, violence against women, and the rise of religious extremism in Pakistan, and the continuing dictatorship in Cuba, along with the increasing violence against activists like Harold Sapero and Osvaldo Paya. But there is one thing that runs through each situation uh, that we've heard about tonight, which is the commitment, the determination, and the courage of each of these activists in their struggle to build a better and a more democratic society. 
and the fact that they all represent a new generation should fill us, should give us hope for the future. We pledge to them and to others fighting for democracy, and this is the, an act this evening, um, an act of moral and political solidarity, and we pledge that to them that we will continue to demonstrate that moral and political solidarity in everything that we do in fulfilling our mission at NED. In that spirit, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight and let us continue this important work for democracy. Thank you.